I've sucked the life out of all of you, so I don't know. <laughs> we medievalists were always ahead of our time. We were way ahead of your time. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I think early part of this century, Chaucer half a blog. Mm -hmm. He and John Dick Gower went at it in Middle English. Absolutely. In well, in Middle English and <coughs> blog, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And again, playing with that. And that's one of the things I want to emphasize, you know, when I, when I talk to other teachers and, and things like that is I feel like it's, I mean, and I'm biased here, right? I'm somebody who teaches contemporary and modern American literature. I don't teach the medieval stuff. I don't teach Shakespeare. I don't even teach the 19th century stuff as much. Um, so for me, the contemporary of literature is what gets me. And that contemporary looks very different these days than we may have been accustomed to. And I think we're starting to see that reflected. And it does pose a lot of new challenges for teachers, right? How do we teach literature to individuals who grew up with a very different conception of what narrative could be. And I think that's something to explore. <laughs> yeah. Um, not really a question, but just something that um, came up when you were talking you know, about the different hybrids and stuff like that. Um, one of the other forms that I've seen that come up, um, like people that run online blogs, mm -hmm. um, like uh, specifically, have you ever heard of the oatmeal? Yes, of course, yeah. Okay. Um, so, like, people like Matthew Inman, who runs the Oatmeal, and uh, Allie Brosh, who runs Hyperbole and a Half, mm -hmm. you know, they take their blog posts, these, you know, kind of comics that they make either about their lives or about, you know, things that they observe in society, and they take those and they collect them into print. Right. And people buy them because, right. like, they're entertaining and because they're, you know, a new hybrid. Like, it was just interesting, like, because I'd never really thought of literature like this before. Sure. And then I'd realize that I've been reading it for a long time. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, and I've had conversations like this with Brittany, and in some ways I'm, I'm on the cynical side of looking at the publishing industry um, in probably unhealthy ways. Uh, but, I mean, I think that that's a perfect example of, again, publishers trying to figure out, well, wait, how do we, how do we tap into this? And I've got a copy of Hyperbole and a Half at Home, the book. And you know, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's great, but it's also just the best of what I already saw on the screen but it's a way of selling it, right, and packaging it in a way. And one of the conversations, again, uh, Brittany and I talking about fan fiction, one of the conversations that came up is that for a lot of fan fiction writers, especially when Kindle Worlds came out, there were people that were upset with that notion because they didn't want to be part of the publishing industry, right? They existed in a, in a form that made them a lot more comfortable without any middlemen or anything else. And so I think that's another thing on the publishing side where this stuff starts to raise new questions is how do we change publishing? How does publishing change? Or do we just continue to just print in a traditional format things that exist in more dynamic formats elsewhere? I think that's in flux as well. Definitely. Other questions? Comments? Complaints? I think I, think I, I really appreciated the challenge for uh, the future, especially from my perspective of educators. Sure. But I also, uh, I guess with trepidation, uh, look at this generation and especially this particular generation of future uh, producers mm -hmm. of these kinds between high and low. Sure. It used to be so much simpler. Uh, there was high and low culture sure. and if you went to uh, if you went to an undergrad school or you know if you were uh, a MacArthur genius without money and dropped sure. out yeah. uh, <laughs> you could still create fiction that 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 uh, worked against the dynamic of what was already known. This generation just seems like they have so much more of a challenge sure. now. Uh, it's not just uh, the awareness of high culture, but now all of the different elements of low culture, all of the technology, sure. all of the media, all of the sound production, uh, it's, it's like you have to become a, uh, you know, a jack of all trades. Sure, you. sure. And, and uh, wow. I wish I wish you all well. Yeah. Well, I, I think it'd be interesting to, to, to see that because it's it's at the moment where it's still kind of being negotiated. Is it really a jack of all trades, or do we actually ironically get even more specialization right as a result of that? People who just focus in on the, uh, the one thing instead of everything. But it's funny. I even drew the parallel in my American Lit class the other day, very clunkily actually, um, between something like The Wasteland, which at the time has all these allusions to classical literature, to to uh, medieval literature to Greek to all these different things folded in and I said well you know readers at that time you know not all of them but most of them would get some or all of those references 
It's the same thing now as listening to any kind of hip hop song that samples any number of things or references any number of things from video games to other musical artists to pop, you know, pop uh, figures. You know, anytime somebody drops the Kardashian name in a hip hop song, right? You're supposed to know what that is and pro you know, on and on it goes. So there are interesting parallels that actually bridge the gap between what we consider to be traditional literature and traditional publishing, traditional teaching mm -hmm. to today. Um, but I think there's some stark differences as well that, that we're still contending with, definitely. That's why you have a picture of a scared cat on your flyer. Well, exactly, right? <laughs> the, the internet is for cats, as everybody knows. I don't even have the flyer with me right now. Um, but again, the, that, the blending of that and the humor of that and the, the referentialness of it, the version that was popped up on Facebook with, uh, I learned it was Kanye. I didn't realize it was Kanye on there. Again, there's a reference built into that that proliferates out of the central thing. So um, I think there is a, no, a sort of. Kanye, it was R. Kelly, I'm sorry. Oh, it was R. Kelly. Okay. Oh, that's even more disturbing, actually. Uh, no, wait, R there's the cat. There's the cat. <laughs> there is a disclaimer that says cats are not included. So. Um, but I, I, I think, again, that kind of referentiality, as you're talking about, proliferates in so many more ways now. And I think it's a challenge to readers and producers, as you're saying, and, and it's something that's still going to filter out. Um, and when we talk about as instructors, you know, composition instructors, <coughs> literacy used to mean two things, reading and writing. But I think there's so many modes of literacy now that we have to consider, right? Like I even made the joke about PowerPoint literacy. Well, it's a real thing, right? So how do we contend with that? But it's, it's not a study thing. It's something sure. you kind of absorb. I mean, I got Kid Rocks all summer long going through my head. Now, because it's the perfect mashup sure. of Werewolves in London and um, Sweet Home Alabama. Absolutely. Um, that I'd never, never heard before listening to those songs. But that's something that he had absorbed listening to that music growing up sure. in Michigan. Sure. And I think, again, the, the ways in which the writers both now, I mean, and, and Jennifer Egan, who I think does it very, very well, I mean, she's, she herself has even commented on this. She's in her middle 40s. This is not her new thing. She ironically pointed out about the PowerPoint story that she had never used PowerPoint before she decided to write that story. And the, the uh, Twitter story, she actually wrote it out longhand in a Japanese notebook before she ever typed it up in Twitter. She said she's aware of the zeitgeist. She knows that this is something that's going on and this maybe is a new form that needs to be played with, but it's not necessarily her form. And so I think it does change for people who are immersed in this, what kind of literature do they create? What does it look like? What does it comment upon? Um, and I've talked to students who are even, you know, having grown up with it on the Sherman Alexi side of things, like, Oh, you know, we're all going to hell in a handbasket, right? Um, as much as the, you know, celebrate good times, come on side of things, right? Um, and so and now, now you've got me referencing everything. Get a different song stuck in your head. Showing That's your age. Um, it's actually interesting that we keep bringing up music, and George and O'Connor are going to get on me for referencing this again. But um, there, you know, is like music out there that will reference literature and will you know, reimagine that literature. Uh, specifically, there's a couple of songs by this. Uh, he's a rapper, sure. but um, he raps about Edgar Allan Poe sure. and like Hamlet. Sure. And he like he tells the entire story of Hamlet in like a rap song. Sure. And then he like teaches you about like prosody sure. in a song about Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. And so like it's just again like another example of that like kind of new literature that's coming out. But a lot of people kind of forget that you know, music technically is a kind of literature. Sure. Because, I mean, you have to write the lyrics. And and it, it's something, too, that poses a challenge to a lot of teachers and stuff because you, you get things like that. And like, like I said, sometimes it's just for fun and it's a novelty or whatever. But it's also something that does have roots, right, in, in something that we do revere. And we do study. When it's got T.S. Eliot's name on it, we're like, oh, gosh, right? <laughs> but, but when it's got Eminem's name on it or something like that, like, Psh, right? But again, a, a pop song that references, you know, walking around like Holden Caulfield or something like that. I mean, how many layers of, of extra meaning does the song get because it references 
something else, right? And it's something that you can look at. Or like I said, an example that popped into my head when you were talking is if anybody's ever watched Thug Notes on YouTube, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's like the spark notes of classic literature, but through this character of a guy who's, who's dressed up with his do-rag on and has this persona. It's actually very smart stuff. Uh, you know, I've watched it and I think, yeah, that's pretty straight on on how I would teach that work. Uh, but it's just delivered in this very different package. And I think one of the things I would raise is at least being open as educators to the possibility of using those packages, right? If, I mean, for me, studying anything, but particularly studying literature, the number one hurdle, especially for young readers or something like that, is that hurdle of how does any of this have to do with my real life? I mean, we've all heard it before, right? That hurdle becomes 10 times higher when the stuff you're studying on the page looks nothing like the life that they lead every day. And so finding new ways to either literature, what I call literature of the wired world, right? Jennifer Egan, the Richard Powers, the, even the Sherman Alexi that's commenting on that, um, but also that literature that kind of plays with that wired world and, and sort of uses it in new ways might at least be a gateway into talking about other forms of literature as well. Sam, you mentioned YouTube, and I thought of like the Lizzie Bennett Diaries, mm -hmm. the Pride and Prejudice adaptation, and even Crash Course, which is produced by the same people. They have a literature section that they did for multiple novels. Sure. And that's just like, I know when I had to read Pride and Prejudice in high school, I watched the Lizzie Bennett Diaries because it made it so much more current. That sure. It was easier to understand things that I didn't other understand otherwise. Absolutely. And I think, too, on the other end of things, right? Like, I, I passed around the Ophelia book and, and the, the text from Jane Austen book. Um, and again, as artifacts, they're, they're humor writing and they're, they're, they're um, novelties. But, say from a teacher's perspective, whether it's in high school situations, some of those secondary English ed people, or at a college level, um, there are worse ways to get people to engage with the themes and the characters of a text than through social media adaptations, right? Especially ones that are, might be accompanied by a process paper that says, well, tell me why you did it this way. Because, like I said, the, the Hamlet thing, you actually have fundamentally have to understand some of the quirks and themes of Hamlet to make that joke, right? Uh, those of you who read the, the Circe piece, right? Um, again, you kind of have to get the references and everything in there. Uh, but even more fundamentally, like, uh, I don't know if anybody flipped through the, like, the Holden Caulfield profile page. Like, you have to really understand what Salinger was doing in that novel and sort of Holden's obsession with the ducks and the phonies and everything else and his, his esteem for his sister Phoebe in order to create that page and make that joke. And so I feel like even getting students and teaching them uh, the adventures of Huckleberry Finn and then asking them to do Huck Finn's travel blog or something like that, right? That's a way to really get them to break down the story and talk about the events, talk about the important aspects in a blog format. And then, you know, you can talk about, well, how come you put this in there and not this? Well, I thought that was a more important expression of this. Um, and so I think that's an avenue on the other end even of even if you study something traditional, of getting students to engage in a way. Because as foreign as it may sound to us old folks to do you know, a Twitter feed of a classic story, for some of our younger students, it's just as foreign to write a five paragraph thesis driven essay. Um, <laughs> and so at least being able to play with that and blend it in new ways, um, to still get to that kind of critical reading that we want, to still get to that critical understanding, to still connect to these larger universal themes, but through a new form. Right, that might be a little more accessible. Um, I think. I think you know we should be open to that. One of the, the strange things and kind of awkward things about using like these new technologies to create literature is that it dates the piece. It does. You know, it's, Twitter looks the way it looks right now, but you know they could do an update next month, and then everything that's been published with Twitter looking the old way is. Like that's all. Oh, that's pre twenty fifteen. Right? Absolutely. Uh, or even like the PowerPoint. Like PowerPoint doesn't really look like that anymore. Right. Or like that's kind of like an archaic way of using it. Uh, like your way of using it now is like more interesting. Sure. Um, or even like using texts and like IMing and right. texts and stuff. It, it just makes it old already I'm right away, even though it's not that old. I agree. I mean, and that's that's one of the things. You know, uh, uh, you know, three hundred words per page on a printed text is something that's been around for centuries now and it's something that will persist whether it's a e-ink display or not uh, and that's something that the content might date it but the form will not um, but you're right it brings up a new thing and you know even even the Ophelia book right 
Facebook has changed, so you don't even have the the you know Tony is tag anymore, and that has changed. Don't have Claire anymore. Absolutely, exactly. Don't, you, nobody pokes anymore, right? But that used to be a Facebook thing, so even that becomes dated, right? So yeah, that's interesting. That's a very very um, new challenge in that way. Yeah. Well, it also opens things up so that eventually we can get to the point where. If we want to date something that's set on 2003 Facebook, right. we can go back to that old form. Yeah. Absolutely. So right. It's just another creative tool. Sure. And I think, you know, and often um, young adult literature sort of breaks this ground before other kinds of literature. And so you're starting to get things that do exactly that. Um, there was a book that came out um, last year, the year before, called Four to Sixteen Characters. Um, which again is, is somebody sort of, again, a coming of age toil, tale, but told through the, the format and through the style of you know, online media and, and um, uh, sign on names and things like that. Um, and again, uh, late, years later it might date it, but you can also then create a cultural context in your piece that references that time and marks it just as much as you know, driving around in my Model T you know, might do the same thing in a, in a text about the turn of the 20th century. It does. It does become. And you know, now you get people concerned on the internet with doing exactly that, keeping track of those things. The, the um, internet archive, right, where you can go on and see what, Yahoo, what Yahoo's front page looked like on October 1st, 1997, right, um, where people are beginning to get concerned with that because that's the other aspect. You know, speaking as literary scholars, right, one of the things that became an early conversation when I was in graduate school among my colleagues was, you know, here we are reading authors' letters to try and get insight into their work and everything else like that. How do we do that anymore, right? When nobody's writing those letters, they're writing emails. And how many people are thinking of archiving their emails for posterity, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's going to be something that's going to be a lot harder in the future, right? To, to that kind of literary study changes because, again, we, we do things differently now. Um, and yes, somebody's Twitter feed might be a real good insight, some author's Twitter feed into their work, but how long does that stick around? You know, how much is that is archived? So people are starting to get concerned about that. And so how do we begin to archive those things? How do we begin to keep track of those things? How do we keep the old hardware that makes the old software accessible? I had a um, professor when I was in college who talked about how he was very much on the cutting edge of technology his whole life. And so when he wrote his dissertation, he saved it on the newfangled contraption of the time, tape drive. <laughs> and he says at home in his fridge, in the back of his fridge, he now has his dissertation because he needs to preserve it with the cold and the, the seal, right? But he, he doesn't have a tape drive player, so he can't access it, right? Yeah, how do we do that in the future? Uh, oh, I was, we were talking about the Millikan time capsule they just sealed on Friday and that they put CDs in there. It's not to be open for 100 years' time. There's no CD player in there. Are they going to be able to play that CD? I mean, what, I mean, these are bigger questions than just literature, but we, we begin to wonder, right? Because our technology does move so quickly, does change so swiftly. So it impacts a lot of different things. And no, they will not be able to play the CDs because CDs break down. Yeah, well, yeah, they'll also break down. Well, there's that too, right? CDs are Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. And it's interesting because the answer to that question is you have to almost go backwards in time to find a format that they would be able to play. You'd have to go back to like a wax cylinder where something is mechanically worked in mm -hmm. order to read that music, in order to preserve it for the future. So yeah, that's a deep irony. I still track tape and I can't find a player to play it. Yeah, I can't find a player to play it, right? <laughs> but if you had an old wax cylinder, you could even rig up something that would play oh, it, yeah. right? So it's interesting. You almost have to go backwards in time to find something that's universal, right? Mike, did you have a Yeah, well, I was just going to add to that. That's really part of what makes this such a, a dynamic, I don't want to say mode because it's a series of modes, sure. but a, a dynamic platform because it is going to be constantly changing. And the things that we have, while they may be there, are going to look different. So this, this is going to change the nature of things. We're not going to read something in for a long enough period of time to get bored. Sure. To, we're not going to read it for a long enough period of time to really fully understand it. Before, boom, this whole thing is changed again, which keeps us all on our toes and changes the nature of trying to analyze a text. Sure. And makes it really complicated but kind of exciting at the same time. Sure. Point. And it does, it, again, it changes, and it, it's, it's exciting and also terrifying for teachers, right? And again, for the publishing industry as well, because by and large, the publishing industry has been doing the exact same thing in the exact same way for hundreds of years, right? Now, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, crap. You know, how do we keep up? How do we find a new way to do this? 
And so, I mean, it really fundamentally pulls the rug out from a lot of different things in exciting ways, but also terrifying ways. So that's going to be the last two institutions to change. Sure. Publishing, as you mentioned, but as an educator, I can tell you that teachers, they want to teach what they're comfortable with, what they know. Sure. And we tend to want to teach the ways that we were taught. And that's becoming very antiquated and daily almost. So it, it changes the nature sure. of that. So I, I think once education catches up, this thing completely catches fire and goes really rapidly. Sure. And I, I think, too, that um, you know, beyond the, the, the interactive stuff, which is something I want to play with in the classroom, I'm also an advocate, even if you leave that stuff aside, of teaching literature that looks like our 21st century world. I mean, one of the reasons why I specialize in contemporary stuff is because I had an experience way back in college where I read my first Raymond Carver story. And I remember reading, I don't even remember which one it was, but it was the first story I'd ever read that had a credit card in it. And I remember having this moment like, hey, I've got one of those. Right? I mean, maybe not in that, that way. But it was like a moment where what was on the page looked like what I did with my daily life. right? And I feel like that's one of the reasons to, to teach a Richard Powers story that talks about you know, iPods and digital music. right? Or to teach a Jennifer Egan story that kind of talks about that is because it's, it's a point of access. Right? And if one of the things we're concerned with is in this generation of, of new technology and stuff that people read less, Finding a point of access itself is, is a triumph, right? To find a way in and then start talking about Edgar Allan Poe, then start talking about something else. Just to, to find a way in, I think, for a lot of especially secondary teachers becomes very, very important. And I think that's, that's one way in. Yeah. What sort of interests me and sort of a thread I trace throughout the lecture, um, we're, we're sort of classically taught that the major distinction between American literature and British literature is that American literature is all about race and ethnicity sure. and sort of feelings about self and stuff, and British literature is all about class. And something that I kind of noticed that I found fascinating because it corresponds to one of like the bizarre theories I've been cultivating in my hermitage <laughs> is that it this to me in several respects marks a kind of a transition in many ways for us to start being more concerned about class as it manifests in literature, specifically here in American literature. Sure. And I'm thinking about that especially was something I thought about when I saw um, the interactive Treasure Island. Sure. And I was like, wow, uh, this is that's extraordinary, fantastic, sure, whatever, but uh, as we're shifting to that sort of mode with what we produce or what we think about literature as being, um, I sort of had this um, traumatic flashback that I mentally juxtaposed with that of um, this fall being faced with uh, classrooms of uh, urban youth who had laptops the school was providing them, but no concept of how to use sure. any of that uh, technology whatsoever. And I, I think it, it's, it's fascinating and it's interesting that we're having all these kind of shifts in how we access literature and what our literature is about, um, but it's also fantastically divisive. Oh, absolutely. I think, I think that's a very, very important point because you know, one of the things that goes along with this new technological thing is, again, what you're talking about is the digital divide, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, I could go down to the library and free, as long as I have a piece of mail that shows I live in town, get a library card that gives me access to everything, right? And I can get it, and I can read it, and I can hold it, and I can keep it for two weeks, and I can take it back, and I don't, it doesn't cost me a dime. But as more and more books go, and even libraries, right? More and more of their new acquisitions are e-books, right? Then you need this. And that's something that does cost money no matter who you are. And that does start to create things, even if it's traditional text in an e-format. But certainly once it becomes more interactive and stuff, how do we negotiate that? And it's much bigger than just literature. But literature is something that we used to say was completely egalitarian, right? Because anybody anywhere could gain access. I mean, once we get past the, 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 you know, the printing, the beginning of printing, the incunabula period, right? Where only the very elite had access. Um, but if we move in the direction that I'm saying we might be moving in, we do have that additional barrier. Back that Absolutely. Step step on yeah, exactly. Especially if we're saying, you know, again, that question that I don't even know if it still holds water or not, of like, 
the elite literature, the, the next Toni Morrison. Well, if the next Toni Morrison is only writing ergodic literature that's available and accessible through this format, that means that there's a swath of people that don't have access to that, that new voice of America, right? I think that's an important point, definitely. Yeah? At the Ingram lecture last week, uh, the guest lecturer, Lindsay Pollock, talks about how, she's like an expert on millennials, and she talks about how millennials are bringing all this new technology like into the workplace in different fields. Um, what's even scarier is that Generation Y, or Z, that's after us, um, they're, Growing up, knowing how, how to work an iPad from like age three, sure. you know they they can do it better than most adults can because it's, it's so intuitive to them. Um, and so, if you're afraid about us, we should be really afraid for what comes after sure. us. Sure, sure. <laughs> and again, as producers creating new things and and yeah. their understanding of what a narrative is. I mean, in that the the joke being now the what the I've seen it written a couple different times the the TLDR right. Mm -hmm. Too long, didn't read, right? Uh, that one of the things that's lost is that attention span, that ability to critically read, especially if you're, again, if my first experience of reading Robert Louis Stevenson was with sound and videos and everything else like that. Um, it's a new and immersive experience, but it's also one that maybe changes my ability to access the texts in ways that we've, we might value, right? Um, because I would argue that you know, learning to close read a text is also how to close read people, right? And I feel that's something in business or elsewhere where we learn to do that. And maybe that's something that we need to consider and that's something we need to study as well. And but what she was referring to, I think, is just perpetuating a myth. It's been a myth about every generation. Sure. Um, I mean, my generation was supposed to have grown up with computers so we could use them. <laughs> um, uh, the the uh, Gen Xers, oh, they grew up with the, the personal computers sure. so they can use them. Um, even the IT students here, some of the IT students I've met don't know how to get into the deeper access areas of Microsoft Word. So yeah, there's a comfort with it, but there's not really the ability to, use, like you were saying, the ability to really use it, to say, put a header in something, or generate a table from Microsoft Excel and put it in your Word document. And so with each promise of each generation, I'm thinking, oh good. <laughs> and I think, oh no. <laughs> And I think, I think that that's, that's partly, you know, I, I don't know where, you know, I don't know even know if this is a debate, but where, where to stand on this, you know, because I am in some ways very much engaged and interested in this stuff, but I'm also the guy who wants my students to be able to have quiet time with a book, right? And I'm, you know, figuring out how to reconcile that and how to balance that. Like you're saying, oh, yay, but also, oh, no, right? And I feel like I, I feel the same way. And it's ironic, too, as you were talking, I was thinking the reverse. As I said, that, that debate about whether I, it was okay for me to call the traditional reading experience a passive experience, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not passive, because you engage with your mind and you picture the story and you fit yourself into it. Um, based on what you're saying, I mean, there's a way to read ergodic literature and literature that's more interactive as even more passive. Because, like a movie, you can sit down and let the work be done for you. Or fast and, forward or skip. Yeah, or fast yeah. forward or skip and not have to deal with the text, not have to do the work yourself. So there's a way to flip that exactly around and say that these new forms of literature are actually more passive, right? It's and like more one way. Like skipping the, the cutscenes in video games. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't do that. Or just <laughs> skipping whole levels, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think that like a lot of this debate, it kind of goes down to like the individual because um, a lot of stuff makes me think of my brother. My brother has like fairly moderate ADHD, sure. and so he doesn't read. He doesn't, you know, books bore him because he he just he can't focus, you know, long enough to get through a whole novel. But he reads, you know, The Walking Dead. He reads graphic novels. Sure. He he, re he loves Scott Pilgrim, you know, and he loves video games. Like when you throw in, you know, more visual aspects to literature and you throw in more interactive aspects to literature. I think for certain individuals who may have things like ADHD or may have other learning disabilities, it gives them access to things they wouldn't normally have access sure. to. And therefore, kind of in a way, doesn't single them out as much. And so they don't quite feel so alienated from the rest of their peers. Absolutely. And I think being aware of that. And uh, a lot of what I've talked about today, I started to, to talk about when I was on Fulbright in Germany a couple years ago. And I was talking to a lot of um, 
their equivalent of secondary educators who teach English, right? And they were looking for new ways to teach American literature as part of almost an English language classroom. And one of the things I got into the biggest debate about, or just conversations about, was graphic fiction, graphic narratives. Because they're used to teaching you know, things that have complex themes and things like that. And they think about comic books as comic books. And so I was saying, well, the interesting thing about this is I'm arguing that you can find graphic narratives that deal with just as, as complex, deep, nuanced themes as anything else, some of the examples I gave. But it also has the added benefit of in an English language classroom, you get the text that you're learning to speak in English along with the pictures that can help you understand that text. And so they, they had thought about graphic literature as what they're losing by doing that. Yes, you get the language benefit, but you lose the complexity, you lose the, the nuance, the themes, the cultural studies aspect. And so one of the things I started talking about, well, no, you know, if you start looking at graphic narratives and, and some of the complex ones, you get both. Right? And I think being, paying attention to what extra you can do with these kinds of things, rather than what you lose, I think that you find all kinds of things, especially with different kinds of learners, right? Whether that's linguistic or, or uh, attention-based or what have you. But I think our traditional reading, I mean, for me, traditional reading is interactive. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, in the sense that, I mean, my mind is going and picturing things and watching action. I can't read without a pencil in my hand. Sure. I've got a library book now because I lost my copy. And I want a pencil, <laughs> so bad. I mean, that's how interactive, you know, and that's reading as a professional. Sure. Way, I think. And I think, I think, you know, I go back to, um, again, another one of these talks last semester where you were doing your, uh, Dr. O'Connor was talking about Poe and some of those things. Some of the ways of studying Poe's texts that you brought up um, almost aren't even possible pre-electronic versions, right? Where you actually are able to search for word uh, usage and pairings of words and the proliferation of certain phrases and things like that. Well, yes, you could do it. You could sit down and, and go through, and which is how people did it with the yeah concordances with the d double projection. This is how uh, scholars used to study text to look at concordances and stuff. Was literally to project two two pages on the wall and be able to compare them side by side. Um, very very different in the electronic age. But again, new ways of studying texts, right? Um, that open up because of this too. I, I feel like one of the reasons I started to talk about these things is because there was, there was just so much resistance on so many levels, right, on instructor, administrator, even student level of acknowledging these changes and recognizing them or, or f even fighting against them. And I feel like some of that, I, again, like personally, I, I'm, I'm probably more on the side of the traditionalist, right? But recognizing that there's just too many changes to ignore and too many new ways that offer new options that might be very valuable even over here by ac acknowledging them over here. Um, so I feel like that's also one of the conversations I wanted to, to kind of start. I'm probably preaching to the choir anyway here. But so. <laughs> Other questions, comments? All right, well thank you and thank you for being here and thank you for your patience. and. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to, to, to or if I'm able to plug it or not, because there's been some venue shifts. But <laughs> the next event is a uh, creative writing reading, uh, fiction reading, February 28th. It's just Saturday downtown at Wildflower. So Dr. Freck and then Professor Case are both doing fiction readings uh, this Saturday at 3. So you know, come there, too. Yeah. And there's also snacks and coffee and stuff, which <laughs> there's not here. So hey, that's a big plug. Yeah? All right, well, thank you, guys, very much. Thank you. <laughs>